In part 9 of this video series, you're going to learn how to define the exact address for each device that you have in your system, so that you can use those addresses in your PLC program. In part 9 of this video series, you're going to learn how to define the exact address for each device that you have in your system, so that you can use those addresses in your PLC program. In part 9 of this video series, you're going to learn how to define the exact address for each device that you have in your system, so that you can use those addresses in your PLC program. In part 9 of this video series, you're going to learn how to define the exact address for each device that you have in your system, so that you can use those addresses in your PLC program. In part 9 of this video series, you're going to learn how to define the exact address for each device that you have in your system, so that you can use those addresses in your PLC program. To get started writing the PLC program, the first thing that I always need to know is, what are the inputs and the outputs of the system or the machine that I'm trying to control using a PLC program? To get started writing the PLC program, the first thing that I always need to know is, what are the inputs and the outputs of the system or the machine that I'm trying to control using a PLC program? To get started writing the PLC program, the first thing that I always need to know is, what are the inputs and the outputs of the system or the machine that I'm trying to control using a PLC program? To get started writing the PLC program, the first thing that I always need to know is, what are the inputs and the outputs of the system or the machine that I'm trying to control using a PLC program? To get started writing the PLC program, the first thing that I always need to know is, what are the inputs and the outputs of the system or the machine that I'm trying to control using a PLC program? Based on the diagram that I have here, I can say that I have two inputs and three outputs for this system. Based on the diagram that I have here, I can say that I have two inputs and three outputs for this system. Based on the diagram that I have here, I can say that I have two inputs and three outputs for this system. Based on the diagram that I have here, I can say that I have two inputs and three outputs for this system. Based on the diagram that I have here, I can say that I have two inputs and three outputs for this system. The inputs include the start and the stop switches, and the outputs include the main, the star, and the delta contactors. The inputs include the start and the stop switches, and the outputs include the main, the star, and the delta contactors. The inputs include the start and the stop switches, and the outputs include the main, the star, and the delta contactors. The inputs include the start and the stop switches, and the outputs include the main, the star, and the delta contactors. The inputs include the start and the stop switches, and the outputs include the main, the star, and the delta contactors. If I take a look at the input module's details in the hardware, this DI32 tells me that this module has 32 digital inputs. If I take a look at the input module's details in the hardware, this DI32 tells me that this module has 32 digital inputs. If I take a look at the input module's details in the hardware, this DI32 tells me that this module has 32 digital inputs. If I take a look at the input module's details in the hardware, this DI32 tells me that this module has 32 digital inputs. If I take a look at the input module's details in the hardware, 
This DI32 tells me that this module has 32 digital inputs. This means that I'm able to connect 32 different digital signals from 32 different devices to this module. This means that I'm able to connect 32 different digital signals from 32 different devices to this module. This means that I'm able to connect 32 different digital signals from 32 different devices to this module. This means that I'm able to connect 32 different digital signals from 32 different devices to this module. This means that I'm able to connect 32 different digital signals from 32 different devices to this module. In the I address section, it says that the addresses for this module start at byte 0 and continue all the way to byte 3. In the I address section, it says that the addresses for this module start at byte 0 and continue all the way to byte 3. In the I address section, it says that the addresses for this module start at byte 0 and continue all the way to byte 3. In the I address section, it says that the addresses for this module start at byte 0 and continue all the way to byte 3. In the I address section, it says that the addresses for this module start at byte 0 and continue all the way to byte 3. So, the total number of memory bytes that are available for addressing this module is 4 bytes. So, the total number of memory bytes that are available for addressing this module is 4 bytes. So, the total number of memory bytes that are available for addressing this module is 4 bytes. So, the total number of memory bytes that are available for addressing this module is 4 bytes. So, the total number of memory bytes that are available for addressing this module is 4 bytes. Given the fact that every byte includes 8 bits, I can say that I have 32 bits of memory space that I can use for addressing this module. Given the fact that every byte includes 8 bits, I can say that I have 32 bits of memory space that I can use for addressing this module. Given the fact that every byte includes 8 bits, I can say that I have 32 bits of memory space that I can use for addressing this module. Given the fact that every byte includes 8 bits, I can say that I have 32 bits of memory space that I can use for addressing this module. Given the fact that every byte includes 8 bits, I can say that I have 32 bits of memory space that I can use for addressing this module. So now, I know that the DI module that I have installed on the rack has 32 inputs. So now, I know that the DI module that I have installed on the rack has 32 inputs. So now, I know that the DI module that I have installed on the rack has 32 inputs. So now, I know that the DI module that I have installed on the rack has 32 inputs. So now, I know that the DI module that I have installed on the rack has 32 inputs. Now, what are the addresses for each input? 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 Since the input addresses start at byte 0, the address for the first input of this module would be IOO. Since the input addresses start at byte 0, the address for the first input of this module would be IOO. Since the input addresses start at byte 0, the address for the first input of this module 
would be IOO. Since the input addresses start at byte 0, the address for the first input of this module would be IOO. Since the input addresses start at byte 0, the address for the first input of this module would be IOO. Using that same model, the next input address for this module would be IO1, and the next one would be IO2. Using that same model, the next input address for this module would be IO1, and the next one would be IO2. Using that same model, the next input address for this module would be IO1, and the next one would be IO2. Using that same model, the next input address for this module would be IO1, and the next one would be IO2. Using that same model, the next input address for this module would be IO1, and the next one would be IO2. This continues all the way up to the last input address, which is I37. This continues all the way up to the last input address, which is I37. This continues all the way up to the last input address, which is I37. This continues all the way up to the last input address, which is I37. This continues all the way up to the last input address, which is I37. Here, the letter I shows that this address belongs to the inputs. Here, the letter I shows that this address belongs to the inputs. Here, the letter I shows that this address belongs to the inputs. Here, the letter I shows that this address belongs to the inputs. Here, the letter I shows that this address belongs to the inputs. The first digit represents the byte number, and the second digit represents the bit number. The first digit represents the byte number, and the second digit represents the bit number. The first digit represents the byte number, and the second digit represents the bit number. The first digit represents the byte number, and the second digit represents the bit number. The first digit represents the byte number, and the second digit represents the bit number. For example, here, IO2 is the input number 2, or the bit number 2, from byte number 0. For example, here, IO2 is the input number 2, or the bit number 2, from byte number 0. For example, here, IO2 is the input number 2, or the bit number 2, from byte number 0. For example, here, IO2 is the input number 2, or the bit number 2, from byte number 0. For example, here, IO2 is the input number 2, or the bit number 2, from byte number 0. As I mentioned before, I have two inputs for this system, and if I want to write a PLC program and use these inputs in my program, I have to know the exact address for each of these switches. As I mentioned before, I have two inputs for this system, and if I want to write a PLC program and use these inputs in my program, I have to know the exact address for each of these switches. As I mentioned before, I have two inputs for this system, and if I want to write a PLC program and use these inputs in my program, I have to know the exact address for each of these switches. As I mentioned before, I have two inputs for this system, 
And if I want to write a PLC program and use these inputs in my program, I have to know the exact address for each of these switches. As I mentioned before, I have two inputs for this system. And if I want to write a PLC program and use these inputs in my program, I have to know the exact address for each of these switches. Now, assuming the start switch is connected to the first input of the digital input module, now, assuming the start switch is connected to the first input of the digital input module, now, assuming the start switch is connected to the first input of the digital input module, now, assuming the start switch is connected to the first input of the digital input module, now, Assuming the start switch is connected to the first input of the digital input module, the address that I can use for this switch in the program is IOO. And assuming the stop switch is connected to the next input of the same module, its address would be IO1. The address that I can use for this switch in the program is IOO. And assuming the stop switch is connected to the next input of the same module, its address would be IO1. The address that I can use for this switch in the program is IOO. And assuming the stop switch is connected to the next input of the same module, its address would be IO1. The address that I can use for this switch in the program is IOO. And assuming the stop switch is connected to the next input of the same module, its address would be IO1. The address that I can use for this switch in the program is IOO. And assuming the stop switch is connected to the next input of the same module, its address would be IO1. For the output module, DO16 tells me that this module has 16 digital outputs. And again, this tells me that I'm able to connect 16 different devices that are capable of receiving digital signals to this module. For the output module, DO16 tells me that this module has 16 digital outputs. And again, this tells me that I'm able to connect 16 different devices that are capable of receiving digital signals to this module. For the output module, DO16 tells me that this module has 16 digital outputs. And again, this tells me that I'm able to connect 16 different devices that are capable of receiving digital signals to this module. For the output module, DO16 tells me that this module has 16 digital outputs. And again, this tells me that I'm able to connect 16 different devices that are capable of receiving digital signals to this module. For the output module, DO16 tells me that this module has 16 digital outputs. And again, this tells me that I'm able to connect 16 different devices that are capable of receiving digital signals to this module. In the Q address section, I see that the addresses for this module start at byte 4 and continue to byte 5. In the Q address section, I see that the addresses for this module start at byte 4 and continue to byte 5. In the Q address section, I see that the addresses for this module start at byte 4 and continue to byte 5. In the Q address section, I see that the addresses for this module start at byte 4 and continue to byte 5. In the Q address section, I see that the addresses for this module start at byte 4 and continue to byte 5. This is 2 bytes or 16 bits. This is 2 bytes or 16 bits. This is 2 bytes or 16 bits. This is 2 bytes 
or 16 bits. This is 2 bytes or 16 bits. Considering these addresses, I can say that the first output's address for this module is Q40. The next is Q41, and this continues all the way to the last output address, which is Q57. Considering these addresses, I can say that the first output's address for this module is Q40. The next is Q41, and this continues all the way to the last output address, which is Q57. Considering these addresses, I can say that the first output's address for this module is Q40. The next is Q41, and this continues all the way to the last output address, which is Q57. Considering these addresses, I can say that the first output's address for this module is Q40. The next is Q41 and this continues all the way to the last output address, which is Q57. Considering these addresses, I can say that the first output's address for this module is Q40. The next is Q41, and this continues all the way to the last output address, which is Q57. If the main contactor is connected to the first output of the digital output module, the address that I can use for this output in the software is Q40. If the main contactor is connected to the first output of the digital output module, the address that I can use for this output in the software is Q40. If the main contactor is connected to the first output of the digital output module, the address that I can use for this output in the software is Q40. If the main contactor is connected to the first output of the digital output module, the address that I can use for this output in the software is Q40. If the main contactor is connected to the first output of the digital output module, the address that I can use for this output in the software is Q40. With the same assumption, the address for the star and the delta contactors that are connected to the second and third outputs are Q41 and Q42, respectively. With the same assumption, the address for the star and the delta contactors that are connected to the second and third outputs are Q41 and Q42, respectively. With the same assumption, the address for the star and the delta contactors that are connected to the second and third outputs are Q41 and Q42, respectively. With the same assumption, the address for the star and the delta contactors that are connected to the second and third outputs are Q41 and Q42, respectively. With the same assumption, the address for the star and the delta contactors that are connected to the second and third outputs are Q41 and Q42, respectively. Now I know all of the addresses for each device that I have in the system. Now I know all of the addresses for each device that I have in the system. Now I know all of the addresses for each device that I have in the system. Now I know all of the addresses for each device that I have in the system. Now I know all of the addresses for each device that I have in the system. In this and the next video, you're going to learn how to assign a tag or a symbolic name to each address, and then start writing the PLC program. 
In this and the next video, you're going to learn how to assign a tag or a symbolic name to each address, and then start writing the PLC program. In this and the next video, you're going to learn how to assign a tag or a symbolic name to each address, and then start writing the PLC program. In this and the next video, you're going to learn how to assign a tag or a symbolic name to each address, and then start writing the PLC program. In this and the next video, you're going to learn how to assign a tag or a symbolic name to each address, and then start writing the PLC program. After configuring the hardware to get started writing the PLC program, I'll open the S7 program folder and then open the Blocks folder here in the Somatic Manager. After configuring the hardware to get started writing the PLC program, I'll open the S7 program folder, and then open the Blocks folder here in the Somatic Manager. After configuring the hardware to get started writing the PLC program, I'll open the S7 program folder, and then open the Blocks folder here in the Somatic Manager. After configuring the hardware to get started writing the PLC program, I'll open the S7 program folder, and then open the Blocks folder here in the Somatic Manager. After configuring the hardware to get started writing the PLC program, I'll open the S7 program folder, and then open the Blocks folder here in the Somatic Manager. As you can see, the Blocks folder contains the system data and another block named OB1. As you can see, the Blocks folder contains the system data and another block named OB1. As you can see, the Blocks folder contains the system data and another block named OB1. As you can see, the Blocks folder contains the system data and another block named OB1. As you can see, the Blocks folder contains the system data and another block named OB1. OB1 is where I can write my PLC program. OB1 is where I can write my PLC program. OB1 is where I can write my PLC program. OB1 is where I can write my PLC program. OB1 is where I can write my PLC program. I'll double click on this block to get into the programming environment. I'll double click on this block to get into the programming environment. I'll double click on this block to get into the programming environment. I'll double click on this block to get into the programming environment. I'll double click on this block to get into the programming environment. Here is the programming environment for Step 7, version 5.5. Here is the programming environment for Step 7, version 5.5. Here is the programming environment for Step 7, version 5.5. Here is the programming environment for Step 7, version 5.5. Here is the programming environment for Step 7, version 5.5. As you can see, the programming environment looks very simple. As you can see, the programming environment looks very simple. As you can see, the programming environment looks very simple. As you can see, the programming environment looks very simple. As you can see, the programming environment looks very simple. This section is where you can write your PLC program. And this section is where you can have access to different PLC programming instructions. This section is where you can write your PLC program. And this section is where you can have access to different PLC programming instructions. This section is where you can write your PLC program. And this section is where you can have access to different PLC programming instructions. This section is where you can write your PLC program. 
and this section is where you can have access to different PLC programming instructions. This section is where you can write your PLC program, and this section is where you can have access to different PLC programming instructions. As I mentioned before, when you have all the input and output addresses defined for the system, you can assign a tag or a symbolic name to each address. As I mentioned before, when you have all the input and output addresses defined for the system, you can assign a tag or a symbolic name to each address. As I mentioned before, when you have all the input and output addresses defined for the system, you can assign a tag or a symbolic name to each address. As I mentioned before, when you have all the input and output addresses defined for the system, you can assign a tag or a symbolic name to each address. As I mentioned before, when you have all the input and output addresses defined for the system, you can assign a tag or a symbolic name to each address. This makes both writing and troubleshooting the PLC program much easier. This makes both writing and troubleshooting the PLC program much easier. This makes both writing and troubleshooting the PLC program much easier. This makes both writing and troubleshooting the PLC program much easier. This makes both writing and troubleshooting the PLC program much easier. To do that, from the option menu, I'll open the symbol table. To do that, from the option menu, I'll open the symbol table. To do that, from the option menu, I'll open the symbol table. To do that, from the option menu, I'll open the symbol table. To do that, from the option menu, I'll open the symbol table. This is the table that I can use to assign a relevant tag to each address that I'm going to use in the software. This is the table that I can use to assign a relevant tag to each address that I'm going to use in the software. This is the table that I can use to assign a relevant tag to each address that I'm going to use in the software. This is the table that I can use to assign a relevant tag to each address that I'm going to use in the software. This is the table that I can use to assign a relevant tag to each address that I'm going to use in the software. As you can see, there's already a tag considered for OB1 in this table. As you can see, there's already a tag considered for OB1 in this table. As you can see, there's already a tag considered for OB1 in this table. As you can see, there's already a tag considered for OB1 in this table. As you can see, there's already a tag considered for OB1 in this table. Here is the list of the inputs and outputs that I'm going to use in my PLC program. Here is the list of the inputs and outputs that I'm going to use in my PLC program. Here is the list of the inputs and outputs that I'm going to use in my PLC program. Here is the list of the inputs and outputs that I'm going to use in my PLC program. Here is the list of the inputs and outputs that I'm going to use in my PLC program. Based on this list, I'll start creating a few tags or symbolic names for each address. Based on this list, I'll start creating a few tags or symbolic names for each address. Based on this list, I'll start creating a few tags or symbolic names for each address. Based on this list, I'll start creating a few tags or symbolic names for each address. Based on this list, I'll start creating a few tags or symbolic names for each address. The first tag or symbol I'll insert here 
is the start tag. Then in the address column, I'll insert the address, which is IOO, and then hit enter. The first tag or symbol I'll insert here is the start tag. Then in the address column, I'll insert the address, which is IOO, and then hit enter. The first tag or symbol I'll insert here is the start tag. Then in the address column, I'll insert the address, which is IOO, and then hit enter. The first tag or symbol I'll insert here is the start tag. Then in the address column, I'll insert the address, which is IOO, and then hit enter. The first tag or symbol I'll insert here is the start tag. Then in the address column, I'll insert the address, which is IOO, and then hit enter. As you can see, the data type for this address will be automatically set as Boolean, which indicates that this is a bit or a digital address. As you can see, the data type for this address will be automatically set as Boolean, which indicates that this is a bit or a digital address. As you can see, the data type for this address will be automatically set as Boolean, which indicates that this is a bit or a digital address. As you can see, the data type for this address will be automatically set as Boolean, which indicates that this is a bit or a digital address. As you can see, the data type for this address will be automatically set as Boolean, which indicates that this is a bit or a digital address. I'll enter the tag STOP for the stop switch, and then hit ENTER. I'll enter the tag STOP for the stop switch, and then hit ENTER. I'll enter the tag STOP for the stop switch, and then hit ENTER. I'll enter the tag STOP for the stop switch, and then hit ENTER. I'll enter the tag STOP for the stop switch, and then hit ENTER. As you can see, this time when I hit ENTER, both address and data type will be set automatically. As you can see, this time when I hit ENTER, both address and data type will be set automatically. As you can see, this time when I hit ENTER, both address and data type will be set automatically. As you can see, this time when I hit ENTER, both address and data type will be set automatically. As you can see, this time when I hit ENTER, both address and data type will be set automatically. For the main contactor, I'll consider the tag name main. For the main contactor, I'll consider the tag name main. For the main contactor, I'll consider the tag name main. For the main contactor, I'll consider the tag name main. For the main contactor, I'll consider the tag name main. I'll revise the address to Q40 for this tag and hit enter again. I'll revise the address to Q40 for this tag and hit enter again. I'll revise the address to Q40 for this tag and hit enter again. I'll revise the address to Q40 for this tag and hit enter again. I'll revise the address to Q40 for this tag and hit enter again. For the star contactor, I'll enter star, and for the delta contactor, I'll consider the tag delta. 
For the star contactor, I'll enter star. And for the delta contactor, I'll consider the tag delta. For the star contactor, I'll enter star. And for the delta contactor, I'll consider the tag delta. For the star contactor, I'll enter star. And for the delta contactor, I'll consider the tag delta. For the star contactor, I'll enter star. And for the delta contactor, I'll consider the tag delta. So here are the tags that I've considered for each address in the software. So here are the tags that I've considered for each address in the software. So here are the tags that I've considered for each address in the software. So here are the tags that I've considered for each address in the software. So here are the tags that I've considered for each address in the software. Now, when I use each one of these addresses in my PLC program, the relevant tag appears next to the address. And as I said, this makes both writing and troubleshooting the program much easier. Now, when I use each one of these addresses in my PLC program, the relevant tag appears next to the address. And as I said, this makes both writing and troubleshooting the program much easier. Now, when I use each one of these addresses in my PLC program, the relevant tag appears next to the address. And as I said, this makes both writing and troubleshooting the program much easier. Now, when I use each one of these addresses in my PLC program, the relevant tag appears next to the address. And as I said, this makes both writing and troubleshooting the program much easier. Now, when I use each one of these addresses in my PLC program, the relevant tag appears next to the address. And as I said, this makes both writing and troubleshooting the program much easier. Now, I'm going to hit Save, close this window, and get back to the programming environment. Now, I'm going to hit Save, close this window, and get back to the programming environment. Now, I'm going to hit Save, close this window, and get back to the programming environment. Now, I'm going to hit Save, close this window, and get back to the programming environment. Now, I'm going to hit Save, close this window, and get back to the programming environment. Now, considering the three phase motor, and the star delta starter I have here. Now, considering the three phase motor and the star delta starter I have here. Now, considering the three phase motor and the star delta starter I have here. Now, considering the three phase motor and the star delta starter I have here. Now, considering the three phase motor and the star delta starter I have here, I need to write a PLC program with the following conditions. When the start switch is pressed, both main and star contactors are going to be energized at the same time. I need to write a PLC program with the following conditions. When the start switch is pressed, both main and star contactors are going to be energized at the same time. I need to write a PLC program with the following conditions. When the start switch is pressed, both main and star contactors are going to be energized at the same time. I need to write a PLC program with the following conditions. When the start switch is pressed, both main and star contactors are going to be energized at the same time. I need to write a PLC program with the following conditions. When the start switch is pressed, both main and star contactors are going to be energized at the same time. After eight seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized automatically. And at the same time, the delta contactor is going to be energized 
while the main contactor remains energized. After 8 seconds, the start contactor is going to be de-energized automatically, and at the same time, the delta contactor is going to be energized while the main contactor remains energized. After 8 seconds, the start contactor is going to be de-energized automatically, and at the same time, the delta contactor is going to be energized while the main contactor remains energized. After 8 seconds, the start contactor is going to be de-energized automatically, and at the same time, the delta contactor is going to be energized while the main contactor remains energized. After 8 seconds, the start contactor is going to be de-energized automatically, and at the same time, the delta contactor is going to be energized while the main contactor remains energized. When the stop switch is pressed, all the contactors are going to be de-energized at the same time. When the stop switch is pressed, all the contactors are going to be de-energized at the same time. When the stop switch is pressed, all the contactors are going to be de-energized at the same time. When the stop switch is pressed, all the contactors are going to be de-energized at the same time. When the stop switch is pressed, all the contactors are going to be de-energized at the same time. The star and delta contactor should not be energized at the same time under any situation. The star and delta contactor should not be energized at the same time under any situation. The star and delta contactor should not be energized at the same time under any situation. The star and delta contactor should not be energized at the same time under any situation. The star and delta contactor should not be energized at the same time under any situation. Now, let's get into writing the logic. 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 As the first step, let's write a simple piece of code to energize the main contactor when the start switch is pressed. As the first step, let's write a simple piece of code to energize the main contactor when the start switch is pressed. As the first step, Let's write a simple piece of code to energize the main contactor when the start switch is pressed. As the first step, let's write a simple piece of code to energize the main contactor when the start switch is pressed. As the first step, let's write a simple piece of code to energize the main contactor when the start switch is pressed. To do this, I'll open the BitLogic folder here. Select an SR flip-flop, and then drag that and place the instruction on the first network. To do this, I'll open the BitLogic folder here. Select an SR flip-flop, and then drag that and place the instruction on the first network. To do this, I'll open the BitLogic folder here. Select an SR flip-flop, and then drag that and place the instruction on the first network. To do this, I'll open the BitLogic folder here. Select an SR flip-flop, and then drag that and place the instruction on the first network. To do this, I'll open the BitLogic folder here. Select an SR flip-flop, and then drag that 
and place the instruction on the first network. This instruction has two inputs of set and reset, and also one output. This instruction has two inputs of set and reset, and also one output. This instruction has two inputs of set and reset, and also one output. This instruction has two inputs of set and reset, and also one output. This instruction has two inputs of set and reset, and also one output. When the set input is true, the output is going to be energized, and when the reset input is true, the output is going to be de-energized. When the set input is true, the output is going to be energized, and when the reset input is true, the output is going to be de-energized. When the set input is true, the output is going to be energized, and when the reset input is true, the output is going to be de-energized. When the set input is true, the output is going to be energized, and when the reset input is true, the output is going to be de-energized. When the set input is true, the output is going to be energized, and when the reset input is true, the output is going to be de-energized. That's it. Very simple. 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 Now, I'm going to use this flip-flop to control the main contactor. So what I'm going to do is assign the address of this output for the instruction. Now, I'm going to use this flip-flop to control the main contactor. So what I'm going to do is assign the address of this output for the instruction. Now, I'm going to use this flip-flop to control the main contactor. So what I'm going to do is assign the address of this output for the instruction. Now, I'm going to use this flip-flop to control the main contactor. So what I'm going to do is assign the address of this output for the instruction. Now, I'm going to use this flip-flop to control the main contactor. So what I'm going to do is assign the address of this output for the instruction. As you can see, since I've already defined a tag for this address, the tag will appear under the address. As you can see, since I've already defined a tag for this address, the tag will appear under the address. As you can see, since I've already defined a tag for this address, the tag will appear under the address. As you can see, since I've already defined a tag for this address, the tag will appear under the address. As you can see, since I've already defined a tag for this address, the tag will appear under the address. Now, if I enter any address that has not been associated with any tag, I will only see the address here. Now, if I enter any address that has not been associated with any tag, I will only see the address here. Now, if I enter any address that has not been associated with any tag, I will only see the address here. Now, if I enter any address that has not been associated with any tag, I will only see the address here. Now, if I enter any address that has not been associated with any tag, I will only see the address here. As I said, with this flip-flop instruction, when the set input is true, the output is going to be energized. As I said, 
With this flip-flop instruction, when the set input is true, the output is going to be energized. As I said, with this flip-flop instruction, when the set input is true, the output is going to be energized. As I said, with this flip-flop instruction, when the set input is true, the output is going to be energized. As I said, with this flip-flop instruction, when the set input is true, the output is going to be energized. This means, if I make this input true, I can energize the main contactor. This means, if I make this input true, I can energize the main contactor. This means, if I make this input true, I can energize the main contactor. This means, if I make this input true, I can energize the main contactor. This means, if I make this input true, I can energize the main contactor. So what I'm going to do here is to add an open contact with the address of the start switch. So what I'm going to do here is to add an open contact with the address of the start switch. So what I'm going to do here is to add an open contact with the address of the start switch. So what I'm going to do here is to add an open contact with the address of the start switch. So what I'm going to do here is to add an open contact with the address of the start switch. Now, with this code, when I press the start switch, the main contactor is going to be energized. Now, with this code, when I press the start switch, the main contactor is going to be energized. Now, with this code, when I press the start switch, the main contactor is going to be energized. Now, with this code, when I press the start switch, the main contactor is going to be energized. Now, with this code, when I press the start switch, the main contactor is going to be energized. As I said, when the stop switch is pressed, the contactor should be de-energized. As I said, when the stop switch is pressed, the contactor should be de-energized. As I said, when the stop switch is pressed, the contactor should be de-energized. As I said, when the stop switch is pressed, the contactor should be de-energized. As I said, when the stop switch is pressed, the contactor should be de-energized. The stop switch that I have here is a normally closed switch. The stop switch that I have here is a normally closed switch. The stop switch that I have here is a normally closed switch. The stop switch that I have here is a normally closed switch. The stop switch that I have here is a normally closed switch. So, I'll add a close contact in the reset input of the flip-flop with the address of the stop switch. So, I'll add a close contact in the reset input of the flip-flop with the address of the stop switch. So, I'll add a close contact in the reset input of the flip-flop with the address of the stop switch. So, I'll add a close contact in the reset input of the flip-flop with the address of the stop switch. So, I'll add a close contact in the reset input of the flip-flop with the address of the stop switch. With this code, whenever I press the stop switch, the main contactor is going to be de-energized. With this code, whenever I press the stop switch, the main contactor is going to be de-energized. With this code, whenever I press the stop switch, the main contactor is going to be de-energized. With this code, whenever I press the stop switch, the main contactor is going to be de-energized. 
With this code, whenever I press the stop switch, the main contactor is going to be de-energized. Now, you may ask why I used a normally closed switch for the stop command instead of a normally open switch. Now, you may ask why I used a normally closed switch for the stop command instead of a normally open switch. Now, you may ask why I used a normally closed switch for the stop command instead of a normally open switch. Now, you may ask why I used a normally closed switch for the stop command instead of a normally open switch. Now, you may ask why I used a normally closed switch for the stop command instead of a normally open switch. Well, the reason is, when you use a normally open switch instead of a normally closed switch, if the wire that connects the switch to the PLC is ever disconnected, well, the reason is, when you use a normally open switch instead of a normally closed switch, if the wire that connects the switch to the PLC is ever disconnected, well, the reason is, when you use a normally open switch instead of a normally closed switch, if the wire that connects the switch to the PLC is ever disconnected, well, the reason is, when you use a normally open switch instead of a normally closed switch, if the wire that connects the switch to the PLC is ever disconnected, well, the reason is, when you use a normally open switch instead of a normally closed switch, if the wire that connects the switch to the PLC is ever disconnected, whether intentionally or because of a broken wire, you'll be notified, and this helps to ensure a more reliable system. Whether intentionally or because of a broken wire, you'll be notified, and this helps to ensure a more reliable system whether intentionally or because of a broken wire, you'll be notified, and this helps to ensure a more reliable system. Whether intentionally or because of a broken wire, you'll be notified, and this helps to ensure a more reliable system. Whether intentionally or because of a broken wire, you'll be notified, and this helps to ensure a more reliable system. Okay. As I mentioned in the previous lesson, the way that this star delta starter should work is that when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors are going to be energized at the same time. Okay, as I mentioned in the previous lesson, the way that this star delta starter should work is that when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors are going to be energized at the same time. Okay, as I mentioned in the previous lesson, the way that this star delta starter should work is that when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors are going to be energized at the same time. Okay, as I mentioned in the previous lesson, the way that this star delta starter should work is that when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors are going to be energized at the same time. Okay, as I mentioned in the previous lesson, the way that this star delta starter should work is that when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors are going to be energized at the same time. Then, after a few seconds, the star contactor will be de-energized and the delta contactor is going to be energized all while the main contactor stays energized. Then, after a few seconds, the star contactor will be de-energized and the delta contactor is going to be energized, all while the main contactor stays energized. Then, after a few seconds, the star contactor will be de-energized and the delta contactor is going to be energized all while the main contactor stays energized. Then, after a few seconds, the star contactor will be de-energized and the delta contactor is going to be energized, all while the main contactor stays energized. Then, after a few seconds, the star contactor will be de-energized and the delta contactor 
is going to be energized, all while the main contactor stays energized. So first, the main and star contactors are energized, and then the star contactor de-energizes while the delta contactor energizes. So first, the main and star contactors are energized, and then the star contactor de-energizes while the delta contactor energizes. So first, the main and star contactors are energized, and then the star contactor de-energizes while the delta contactor energizes. So first, the main and star contactors are energized, and then the star contactor de-energizes while the delta contactor energizes. So first, the main and star contactors are energized, and then the star contactor de-energizes while the delta contactor energizes. With the current code, I'm only able to energize the main contactor. With the current code, I'm only able to energize the main contactor. With the current code, I'm only able to energize the main contactor. With the current code, I'm only able to energize the main contactor. With the current code, I'm only able to energize the main contactor. But when the main contactor is energized and the motor starts, I need the star contactor to be energized at the same time to control the inrush current. But when the main contactor is energized and the motor starts, I need the star contactor to be energized at the same time to control the inrush current. But when the main contactor is energized and the motor starts, I need the star contactor to be energized at the same time to control the inrush current. But when the main contactor is energized and the motor starts, I need the star contactor to be energized at the same time to control the inrush current. But when the main contactor is energized and the motor starts, I need the star contactor to be energized at the same time to control the inrush current. To do that, I'll click on New Network on the toolbar to add a new network. Then, click on this line and add an SR flip-flop. To do that, I'll click on New Network on the toolbar to add a new network. Then, click on this line and add an SR flip-flop. To do that, I'll click on New Network on the toolbar to add a new network. Then, click on this line and add an SR flip-flop. To do that, I'll click on New Network on the toolbar to add a new network. Then, click on this line and add an SR flip-flop. To do that, I'll click on New Network on the toolbar to add a new network. Then, click on this line and add an SR flip-flop. With this flip-flop, I'm going to energize the star contactor, so I'll assign the address of this contactor for the flip-flop. With this flip-flop, I'm going to energize the star contactor, so I'll assign the address of this contactor for the flip-flop. With this flip-flop, I'm going to energize the star contactor, so I'll assign the address of this contactor for the flip-flop. With this flip-flop, I'm going to energize the star contactor, so I'll assign the address of this contactor for the flip-flop. With this flip-flop, I'm going to energize the star contactor, so I'll assign the address of this contactor for the flip-flop. As I said, the star contactor should be energized at the same time as the main contactor. As I said, the star contactor should be energized 
at the same time as the main contactor. As I said, the star contactor should be energized at the same time as the main contactor. As I said, the star contactor should be energized at the same time as the main contactor. As I said, the star contactor should be energized at the same time as the main contactor. So, I'll add an open contact in the set input of the flip-flop with the address of the main contactor. So, I'll add an open contact in the set input of the flip-flop with the address of the main contactor. So, I'll add an open contact in the set input of the flip-flop with the address of the main contactor. So, I'll add an open contact in the set input of the flip-flop with the address of the main contactor. So, I'll add an open contact in the set input of the flip-flop with the address of the main contactor. With this code, as soon as the start switch is pressed and the main contactor is energized, this open contact will be closed and energize the star contactor as well. With this code, as soon as the start switch is pressed and the main contactor is energized, this open contact will be closed and energize the star contactor as well. With this code, as soon as the start switch is pressed and the main contactor is energized, this open contact will be closed and energize the star contactor as well. With this code, as soon as the start switch is pressed and the main contactor is energized, this open contact will be closed and energize the star contactor as well. With this code, as soon as the start switch is pressed and the main contactor is energized, this open contact will be closed and energize the star contactor as well. So when I press the start switch, both the main and star contactors are going to be energized. So when I press the start switch, both the main and star contactors are going to be energized. So when I press the start switch, both the main and star contactors are going to be energized. So when I press the start switch, both the main and star contactors are going to be energized. So when I press the start switch, both the main and star contactors are going to be energized. The main contactor flows the power to the motor, and the star contactor connects the right side motor terminal together and sets the connection in star. The main contactor flows the power to the motor, and the star contactor connects the right side motor terminal together and sets the connection in star. The main contactor flows the power to the motor, and the star contactor connects the right side motor terminal together and sets the connection in star. The main contactor flows the power to the motor, and the star contactor connects the right side motor terminal together and sets the connection in star. The main contactor flows the power to the motor, and the star contactor connects the right side motor terminal together and sets the connection in star. Now, this star connection should last only for 8 seconds to reduce the inrush current of the three phase electrical motor. Now, this star connection should last only for 8 seconds to reduce the inrush current of the three phase electrical motor. Now, this star connection should last only for 8 seconds to reduce the inrush current of the three phase electrical motor. Now, this star connection should last only for 8 seconds to reduce the inrush current of the three phase electrical motor. 
Now, this star connection should last only for 8 seconds to reduce the inrush current of the three-phase electrical motor. After that, the star contactor should automatically be de-energized, and the delta contactor should be energized at the same time. After that, the star contactor should automatically be de-energized, and the delta contactor should be energized at the same time. After that, the star contactor should automatically be de-energized, and the delta contactor should be energized at the same time. After that, the star contactor should automatically be de-energized, and the delta contactor should be energized at the same time. After that, the star contactor should automatically be de-energized, and the delta contactor should be energized at the same time. When you need to turn on or off something automatically in your PLC program, one of the best tools that you can use is a timer. When you need to turn on or off something automatically in your PLC program, one of the best tools that you can use is a timer. When you need to turn on or off something automatically in your PLC program, one of the best tools that you can use is a timer. When you need to turn on or off something automatically in your PLC program, one of the best tools that you can use is a timer. When you need to turn on or off something automatically in your PLC program, one of the best tools that you can use is a timer. To add a timer, in the Program Elements window, you can open up the Timers folder. To add a timer, in the Program Elements window, you can open up the Timers folder. To add a timer, in the Program Elements window, you can open up the Timers folder. To add a timer, in the Program Elements window, you can open up the Timers folder. To add a timer, in the Program Elements window, you can open up the Timers folder. Here, as you can see, there are five different types of timers that you can use. Here, as you can see, there are five different types of timers that you can use. Here, as you can see, there are five different types of timers that you can use. Here, as you can see, there are five different types of timers that you can use. Here, as you can see, there are five different types of timers that you can use. The type of timer you use in your PLC program depends on what you want to achieve in your program. The type of timer you use in your PLC program depends on what you want to achieve in your program. The type of timer you use in your PLC program depends on what you want to achieve in your program. The type of timer you use in your PLC program depends on what you want to achieve in your program. The type of timer you use in your PLC program depends on what you want to achieve in your program. For instance, here, I need a timer that is able to de-energize the star contactor after 8 seconds. For instance, here, I need a timer that is able to de-energize the star contactor after 8 seconds. For instance, here, I need a timer that is able to de-energize the star contactor after 8 seconds. For instance, here, I need a timer that is able to de-energize the star contactor after 8 seconds. For instance, here, I need a timer that is able to de-energize the star contactor after 8 seconds. That means I need a timer that is able to do something for me automatically after a specific amount of time. That means I need a timer that is able to do something for me automatically after a specific amount of time. 
That means I need a timer that is able to do something for me automatically after a specific amount of time. That means I need a timer that is able to do something for me automatically after a specific amount of time. That means I need a timer that is able to do something for me automatically after a specific amount of time. For that, I can simply make use of an on delay timer. For that, I can simply make use of an on delay timer. For that, I can simply make use of an on delay timer. For that, I can simply make use of an on delay timer. For that, I can simply make use of an on delay timer. The way that this timer works is very simple. The way that this timer works is very simple. The way that this timer works is very simple. The way that this timer works is very simple. The way that this timer works is very simple. Here, when the set input is true, the output is going to be true after some delay. Here, when the set input is true, the output is going to be true after some delay. Here, when the set input is true, the output is going to be true after some delay. Here, when the set input is true, the output is going to be true after some delay. Here, when the set input is true, the output is going to be true after some delay. The amount of time that the output delays depends on the time you enter in the time value input. The amount of time that the output delays depends on the time you enter in the time value input. The amount of time that the output delays depends on the time you enter in the time value input. The amount of time that the output delays depends on the time you enter in the time value input. The amount of time that the output delays depends on the time you enter in the time value input. Now, there are two types of on delay timers in step 7. Now, there are two types of on delay timers in step 7. Now, there are two types of on delay timers in step 7. Now, there are two types of on delay timers in step 7. Now, there are two types of on delay timers in step 7. Normal on delay timer, which is what I currently have here, and retentive on delay timer. Normal on delay timer, which is what I currently have here, and retentive on delay timer. Normal on delay timer, which is what I currently have here, and retentive on delay timer. Normal on delay timer, which is what I currently have here, and retentive on delay timer. Normal on delay timer, which is what I currently have here, and retentive on delay timer. The retentive on delay timer works the same way as the normal on delay timer, but the only difference is that for this timer, if the input goes false while the timer is timing, the output stays true. The retentive on delay timer works the same way as the normal on delay timer, but the only difference is that for this timer, if the input goes false while the timer is timing, the output stays true. The retentive on delay timer works the same way as the normal on delay timer, but the only difference is that for this timer, if the input goes false while the timer is timing, the output stays true. The retentive on delay timer works the same way as the normal on delay timer, but the only difference is that for this timer, if the input goes false while the timer is timing, the output stays true. The retentive on delay timer works the same way as the normal on delay timer, but the only difference is that for this timer, if the input goes false while the timer is timing, the output 
stays true. So for the normal on delay timer, if the input goes false, the output will go false as well. But for the retentive timer, if the input goes false, the output will stay true. So for the normal on delay timer, if the input goes false, the output will go false as well. But for the retentive timer, if the input goes false, the output will stay true. So for the normal on delay timer, if the input goes false, the output will go false as well. But for the retentive timer, if the input goes false, the output will stay true. So for the normal on delay timer, if the input goes false, the output will go false as well. But for the retentive timer, if the input goes false, the output will stay true. So for the normal on delay timer, if the input goes false, the output will go false as well. But for the retentive timer, if the input goes false, the output will stay true. I'm going to use a retentive timer here, so I'll delete the other one. I'm going to use a retentive timer here, so I'll delete the other one. I'm going to use a retentive timer here, so I'll delete the other one. I'm going to use a retentive timer here, so I'll delete the other one. I'm going to use a retentive timer here, so I'll delete the other one. These red question marks here show that I need to consider an address for this timer. These red question marks here show that I need to consider an address for this timer. These red question marks here show that I need to consider an address for this timer. These red question marks here show that I need to consider an address for this timer. These red question marks here show that I need to consider an address for this timer. The addresses that you can use for timers in step 7 start at TO and usually continue up to T255. The addresses that you can use for timers in step 7 start at TO and usually continue up to T255. The addresses that you can use for timers in step 7 start at TO and usually continue up to T255. The addresses that you can use for timers in step 7 start at TO and usually continue up to T255. The addresses that you can use for timers in step 7 start at TO and usually continue up to T255. I'll assign TO as an address for this timer. I'll assign TO as an address for this timer. I'll assign TO as an address for this timer. I'll assign TO as an address for this timer. I'll assign TO as an address for this timer. As I said, I need this timer to de energize the star contactor after 8 seconds. As I said, I need this timer to de energize the star contactor after 8 seconds. As I said, I need this timer to de energize the star contactor after 8 seconds. As I said, I need this timer to de energize the star contactor after 8 seconds. As I said, I need this timer to de energize the star contactor after 8 seconds. So, I'll add an open contact in the set input of the timer with the address of the star contactor. So, I'll add an open contact in the set input of the timer with the address of the star contactor. So, I'll add an open contact in the set input of the timer with the address 
of the star contactor. So, I'll add an open contact in the set input of the timer with the address of the star contactor. So, I'll add an open contact in the set input of the timer with the address of the star contactor. By doing this, as soon as the star contactor is energized, the set input of the timer is going to be energized as well, and the timer starts timing. By doing this, as soon as the star contactor is energized, the set input of the timer is going to be energized as well, and the timer starts timing. By doing this, as soon as the star contactor is energized, the set input of the timer is going to be energized as well, and the timer starts timing. By doing this, as soon as the star contactor is energized, the set input of the timer is going to be energized as well, and the timer starts timing. By doing this, as soon as the star contactor is energized, the set input of the timer is going to be energized as well, and the timer starts timing. I want this timer to be energized with an 8 second delay, so I should enter 8 seconds here as the time value. I want this timer to be energized with an 8 second delay, so I should enter 8 seconds here as the time value. I want this timer to be energized with an 8 second delay, so I should enter 8 seconds here as the time value. I want this timer to be energized with an 8 second delay, so I should enter 8 seconds here as the time value. I want this timer to be energized with an 8 second delay, so I should enter 8 seconds here as the time value. The time value should be entered in S5 time format. The time value should be entered in S5 time format. The time value should be entered in S5 time format. The time value should be entered in S5 time format. The time value should be entered in S5 time format. That means, in step 7, when you want to enter the time value for the timer, you simply need to add S5T pound before the time value. That means, in step 7, when you want to enter the time value for the timer, you simply need to add S5T pound before the time value. That means, in step 7, when you want to enter the time value for the timer, you simply need to add S5T pound before the time value. That means, in step 7, when you want to enter the time value for the timer, you simply need to add S5T pound before the time value. That means, in step 7, when you want to enter the time value for the timer, you simply need to add S5T pound before the time value. For instance, when you need to enter 8 seconds as the time value, you should enter S5T pound 8S. For instance, when you need to enter 8 seconds as the time value, you should enter S5T pound 8S. For instance, when you need to enter 8 seconds as the time value, you should enter S5T pound 8S. For instance, when you need to enter 8 seconds as the time value, you should enter S5T pound 8S. For instance, when you need to enter 8 seconds as the time value, you should enter S5T pound 8S. For 10 seconds, you need to enter S5T pound 10S. For 10 seconds, you need to enter 
S5T pound 10S. For 10 seconds, you need to enter S5T pound 10S. For 10 seconds, you need to enter S5T pound 10S. For 10 seconds, you need to enter S5T pound 10S. Okay, so with this logic, when the star contactor is energized, the set input of the timer is going to be energized. And since this is an on delay timer, it will be activated after 8 seconds. Okay, so with this logic, when the star contactor is energized, the set input of the timer is going to be energized. And since this is an on delay timer, it will be activated after 8 seconds. Okay, so with this logic, when the star contactor is energized, the set input of the timer is going to be energized. And since this is an on delay timer, it will be activated after 8 seconds. Okay, so with this logic, when the star contactor is energized, the set input of the timer is going to be energized. And since this is an on delay timer, it will be activated after 8 seconds. Okay, so with this logic, when the star contactor is energized, the set input of the timer is going to be energized. And since this is an on delay timer, it will be activated after 8 seconds. On the other hand, I want the star contactor to be de energized after 8 seconds, so the timer can definitely help me with that. On the other hand, I want the star contactor to be de energized after 8 seconds, so the timer can definitely help me with that. On the other hand, I want the star contactor to be de energized after 8 seconds, so the timer can definitely help me with that. On the other hand, I want the star contactor to be de energized after 8 seconds, so the timer can definitely help me with that. On the other hand, I want the star contactor to be de energized after 8 seconds. So the timer can definitely help me with that. How? For that, I can simply add an open contact in the reset input of this flip-flop with the address of the timer. How? For that, I can simply add an open contact in the reset input of this flip-flop with the address of the timer. How? For that, I can simply add an open contact in the reset input of this flip flop with the address of the timer. How? For that, I can simply add an open contact in the reset input of this flip flop with the address of the timer. How? For that, I can simply add an open contact in the reset input of this flip flop with the address of the timer. Now, as soon as the timer is active, the star contactor is going to be de energized, and that's how I can de energize the star contactor automatically after 8 seconds. Now, as soon as the timer is active, the star contactor is going to be de energized, and that's how I can de energize the star contactor automatically after 8 seconds. Now, as soon as the timer is active, the star contactor is going to be de energized, and that's how I can de energize the star contactor automatically after 8 seconds. Now, as soon as the timer is active, 
the star contactor is going to be de-energized. And that's how I can de-energize the star contactor automatically after 8 seconds. Now, as soon as the timer is active, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. And that's how I can de-energize the star contactor automatically after 8 seconds. With the current logic, in the first network, when the start switch is pressed, the main contactor will be energized. With the current logic, in the first network, when the start switch is pressed, the main contactor will be energized. With the current logic, in the first network, when the start switch is pressed, the main contactor will be energized. With the current logic, in the first network, when the start switch is pressed, the main contactor will be energized. With the current logic, in the first network, when the start switch is pressed, the main contactor will be energized. At the same time, in the second network, this open contact will be closed and the star contactor will be energized. At the same time, in the second network, this open contact will be closed and the star contactor will be energized. At the same time, in the second network, this open contact will be closed and the star contactor will be energized. At the same time, in the second network, this open contact will be closed and the star contactor will be energized. At the same time, in the second network, this open contact will be closed and the star contactor will be energized. When the star contactor is energized, in the third network, the timer starts timing and after 8 seconds, it will be active. When the star contactor is energized, in the third network, the timer starts timing and after 8 seconds, it will be active. When the star contactor is energized, in the third network, the timer starts timing and after 8 seconds, it will be active. When the star contactor is energized, in the third network, the timer starts timing and after 8 seconds, it will be active. When the star contactor is energized, in the third network, the timer starts timing and after 8 seconds, it will be active. Now, since I have the open contact of the timer in the reset input of this flip-flop, as soon as the timer is active, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. Now, since I have the open contact of the timer in the reset input of this flip-flop, as soon as the timer is active, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. Now, since I have the open contact of the timer in the reset input of this flip-flop, as soon as the timer is active, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. Now, since I have the open contact of the timer in the reset input of this flip-flop, as soon as the timer is active, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. Now, since I have the open contact of the timer in the reset input of this flip-flop, as soon as the timer is active, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after 8 seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after 8 seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. 
So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after eight seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after eight seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after eight seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after eight seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after eight seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after eight seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after eight seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after eight seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after eight seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after eight seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after eight seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after eight seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after eight seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after eight seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after eight seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after eight seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after eight seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized. So with the PLC program that I have here, when the start switch is pressed, both the main and star contactors will be energized. And after eight seconds, the star contactor is going to be de-energized.